Hello, and welcome to another episode of Balanced Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Dr. Jack Wolfson is a board-certified cardiologist who uses nutrition, lifestyle, and supplements to prevent and treat heart disease. He completed a four-year medical degree, a three-year internal medicine residency, and a three-year cardiology fellowship. He served as the chief fellow of his cardiology program, managing other cardiology trainees, and has taught many medical doctors and practitioners from all over the world. Dr. Wolfson then joined the largest cardiology group in the state of Arizona and spent 10 years as a hospital-based cardiologist performing angiograms, pacemakers, and other cardiac procedures. In 2012, Dr. Wolfson founded Natural Heart Doctor to offer patients the ultimate in holistic heart care. Recognized as one of the top holistic medical practitioners in the world, Dr. Wolfson has appeared on major, many major news stations and in major newspapers, along with hundreds of appearances at live events, podcasts, and online interviews. His first book, The Paleocardiologist, The Natural Way to Heart Health, is an Amazon bestseller. He is also a contributing author to the textbook of integrative cardiology. Dr. Jack Wolfson, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Balanced Body Radio. Oh, thanks so much, Casey. Pleasure to, you know, to speak with you today. And again, we got so much to talk about. The world's a sick place and cardiovascular disease, number one killer. So we got a lot to, a lot to accomplish. It's yeah, we really do. And we can just jump right in there. It's so funny that all of these nutritional guidelines that we have originated from dealing with the issues of heart disease. And now it's been 65, 70 years that we recognize that diet may play a role in heart disease. You would think we would be doing so much better at this point with heart disease when really it's still the number one killer of people in the world. It's amazing. Yeah, well, you know, as you know, and as I know other, you know, podcast guests you've had on, you guys have discussed this, you know, where we're kind of like the information went wrong, you know, starting in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and how, uh, you know, the guidelines were written to promote unhealthy foods, high carbohydrate foods, you know, corn, uh, wheat, soy, a lot of grain heavy diet, you know, on what planet of delusion do you think the people who created the food pyramid, you know, were living on? when they had a grain category that was bigger than the vegetable category. And again, those are only guidelines that are influenced by, by big ag, uh, you know, big, big corporations. And unfortunately it's just, uh, it, it's led us to the situation we are, where we are now. Again, people often vilify uh, in meat consumption, but actually average meat consumption of the American has gone down while heart disease has gone up. So, you know, we definitely got to dispel a lot of myths as it relates to nutrition and give people the truth. Yeah, I totally agree. You had to find the truth yourself and you did it so in a very interesting way. And to be able to tell your personal story of how you uncovered the truth, we really have to go back a generation and talk about your father who sounded like an absolutely wonderful man. Can you tell us how you first became interested in health through the journey of your father? Yeah, mostly, you know, my father was a cardiologist uh, and I became a you know, cardiologist, wanted to follow right in his footsteps. I loved, uh, I loved, always loved uh, physiology, the physiology of the heart. And then ultimately, it would take me to, you know, again, to become a cardiologist, as you mentioned in the intro, after 10 years of training. And then I'm two years on the job as a hospital-based cardiologist, very, very successful by definition of, you know, financially, again, we get paid very well in that, in that arena. And then also helping, you know, again, lots and lots of people, very, very busy in the practice. And again, uh, the director of you know, internal medicine and cardiology and cardiac rehab and all those other, uh, low, you know, all those accolades. But as, as I was doing all that, I still saw a lot of sickness around me. Of course, it's very frustrating. The hospital is a revolving door. People come in, we tune them up, we send them out. And we never really seem to be getting anywhere. It's lots of pharmaceuticals and whatnot. But the main impetus really was my father's sickness. My father was a brilliant man, brilliant cardiologist, and, and again, uh, you know, my hero. And uh, he became sick, and he became sick with a diagnosis uh, that would be the ultimate diagnosis of a Parkinson's-like illness called PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy. So eventually, he would be diagnosed at the Mayo Clinic. And at the Mayo Clinic, they said, we have no idea why your father has this condition, and we have no treatment for this condition. And then um, uh, 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 God, uh, spirit, you know, whatever, whatever you believe, put me in the direct path of the woman who would become my wife. And she is a doctor of chiropractic. And I met her and it was a chance, you know, meeting and introduction that put us together. Maybe not so much by chance, like I said, nonetheless, we meet and she opens up my eyes to the reality. 
Mayo Clinic has no idea why my father's sick and dying. And here's this 29 year old chiropractor. She's got all the reasons. And I like to say this, Casey, that I, I listen very quickly. Number one, she's smoking hot. So I listened to what she had to say because she's so beautiful. But I listened to what she had to say because it made perfect sense that if we, if we, eat a certain way, live a certain way, think a certain way, then that's where true health is. And we are not taught any of that in medical school. We are taught about pharmaceuticals. We're taught about surgical procedures. All these things are great in an emergency or in a trauma situation, but they are horrible for prevention. They don't work. So again, I would um, eventually leave that medical practice. I would soon thereafter uh, marry this woman. She would become my wife. And I would leave the big medical practice in 2012 and start a natural heart doctor. Unfortunately, my father uh, did not survive. My father did not live. I was too early in my holistic career. He was too late in his sickness that I couldn't make a change. But his demise, his death uh, created the, the man and the physician that I am today. Yeah, it's certainly such a tragic story, but it is amazing that his legacy does get to continue to live on through you. I've always been curious, especially people in the medical field, especially doctors, <laughs> even more so a cardiologist. What was, I know you said you listened very quickly to your now wife and the things that she was saying, but what was it like for you to be so well trained in the establishment, in the, in the medical system and find out that what you were told, what you were taught wasn't necessarily the best thing for, for like you said, prevention that would be, I don't know, that would be a tough pill to swallow, uh, forget the pun. Yeah, no doubt. You know, it's um, uh, most medical doctors, I mean, obviously, they're, they're very brilliant men and women who go into this profession to become cardiologists and medical doctors in general. Uh, but, you know, again, we're, we only know what we know. So it's kind of like I would say, hey, listen, if I went on the job and I was being an apprentice for a plumber, and the plumber would ask me to do something, I would look like an idiot because I know nothing about plumbing. And the plumber may say, wow, this guy is an idiot. Well, again, I'm not an idiot. I've just never been trained in that. And again, the medical doctors are just not trained in causation. They're trained in, you have high blood pressure, here's your pill. You have abnormal cholesterol, here's your pill. You've got coronary artery disease, here's your pharmaceuticals. Let's do a stress test and a stent and bypass surgery. But you know, ultimately, a lot of doctors are not gonna listen to what is the truth about health and wellness. Because again, they their entire career was spent learning something else. They're not gonna admit that there were that, that that was a wrong model to follow. And then number two, they're financially incentivized to prescribe pharmaceuticals, to see a lot of patients quickly, to do these surgical procedures. And then number three, the scrutiny of the medical boards and of your colleagues, you know, so if you kind of step out of the box, like I did, again, I, I took a lot of stones from the people in my in my old cardiology group, and on a national and on a worldwide level of, you know, people who would say things about me and make complaints about me. But again, it's, um, that's all part of the process. And the more of us holistic practitioners, who, who, you know, tell the truth, and shout it from the rooftops. That's how we're really going to change because pharmaceutical companies and the med you know, and, and the medical establishment that they control, they're very powerful. So the truth, uh, the truth has to be spoken, and if we do, it'll prevail. Yeah, no, that's great. I love that, and I'm glad you brought that up because you were experiencing some pressure from people either above you or adjacent to you and what you were doing, saying that you're not earning as much money as you were when you were doing more of these procedures and prescriptions. Is that correct? Do I understand that right? Yeah, I mean, again, when you're in the big cardiology group, you're incentivized to see patients very quickly, people very quickly, and then you're incentivized, of course, to order tests and procedures. So when you order uh, stress tests, when you order ultrasounds, when you order angiograms and pacemakers, again, all of that is how do the doctors get reimbursed. Yet my new patient consultations these days are 90 minutes long because we have to discover a lot of things. And again, in the traditional medical model, that visit was less than 10 minutes, and now it's 90 minutes. So you really can't practice insurance-based medicine or health when you're, when you're a holistic practitioner. When you opt out of that, you typically don't accept insurance, only because, again, you have to be able to see people for a long period of time, and none of that should be kind of you know, guided or limited, really, by insurance companies. 
Yeah. You mentioned the difference between chronic care and more like acute care or care in an emergency. As you look back on the things that you were taught and the procedures you were doing before, what are maybe one or two examples of things that you look back on and maybe cringe a little bit now to think like, ah, we probably did this in more cases than it was needed? Yeah, that's a great question, Casey, and uh, thank you for asking it. And undoubtedly, stress testing is the number one thing that comes to mind. Again, annual stress tests on people. We order it all the time, so do most cardiologists, and there really is no scientific value to that. All there is is risk. Risk really twofold. Number one, the radiation risk of doing a nuclear stress test. And then number two, the, the false positive rate. So let's say a stress test is done, and it, it, the test is abnormal, and then it leads you to the next step, and maybe that's an angiogram, and the angiogram maybe is normal, but you put the person at risk of doing the angiogram when they really didn't need it. So I could talk a lot about all of the mishaps and really malpractice inside of the cardiology realm. There's a lot of it going on. And again, it's just so unfortunate that the people suffer, but, and, and it really is just a revenue grab. There's so many examples of that, of what conventional doctors are doing, and there really is no value to it. That's a, that's a really strong statement to talk about like malpractice, but we got the same sort of answer from Dr. Thomas Seyfried, who is at Boston College, uh, I believe Boston University, and he's studying cancer. And he talks about, you know, treating revenue, creating diseases. These diseases create revenue. And if you tell somebody alternate advice and get them out of the system and get them healthy, they're not generating revenue for everybody. That's a huge problem. Yeah, you know, again, that's why I, nobody was uh, upset when I left uh, the conventional cardiology practice, because again, I would kind of espouse these truths, you know, very early on and, um, you know, certainly very on in my holistic career. And, uh, you know, ultimately, again, it's just bad for business. Again, why doesn't, you know, the Cleveland Clinic and the Mayo Clinic and all these big hospital institutions have you know, big nutrition departments and 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 really preventive, you know, areas, uh, they don't because it doesn't pay the bills. And, and quickly, if someone tries to introduce that, then they will be quickly uh, ushered out of that situation. And, uh, you know, again, that's okay. We're going to circumvent all that. We're going to talk like you and I are right now. We're going to share this information. We're going to take it directly to the people. And then the people are going to go back to their doctors and say, hey, I want a better approach. And if you don't have that, then uh, then I'm not going to, uh, you know, again, be your patient. And once that patient pool starts to shrink, as it already is for mainstream doctors, although, again, there still are 330 million people in this country, the majority of which are still very sick and do not understand about health and wellness. Uh, so, again, we're not we're not getting rid of the medical doctors, you know, currently. But again, I'd certainly see a day, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the road when this in, this, this type of, of practice is, is really commonplace. I sure hope so. That makes me so optimistic. We talk about all the time, the, the delta between the people that are getting healthier and finding this type of information versus the other people that are following all the standard device and their health is absolutely just deteriorating at such a fast rate. That split between the two is just growing and growing and growing it's, and, and it's getting so wide that you're right. That's, that's what makes me optimistic as well, that we're going to be able to get this message out because at some point there's going to be so many people getting healthier by doing the opposite of what they're told. That's going to carry this message message forward. So before we get into the pillars that you talk about and the, the other things that you talk about, which I absolutely love, and I really want to get into, tell us a little bit about the challenges as you started, you know, kind of, you know, you opened your clinic and you started doing things a little bit differently. You did mention financials. That is a financially very different thing. And I don't blame any doctor for not staying in the medical field and generating money doing it. I don't blame them because you need to put bread on the table. What, what were some of the challenges you faced early on with going your own way? Well, I mean, ultimately, I think that, um, you know, as they say, uh, cliche, right, we only go around once. And uh, the proverbial, hey, when I'm on my uh, deathbed, and I'm surrounded by my family and friends, what do I, what do I want them to know about me? That, that I, I did it for the money. I didn't, uh, I, I didn't like my career. I knew that what I was doing was wrong, but again, I wanted to support everybody in this room the best that I could. I guess one could take that approach and that may be right for some people. It was, it certainly was not right for me. 
So in doing so, when you're, you know, you know, I was making over a million dollars a year as a conventional cardiologist. And I say that not to brag, obviously, but I say it because of how lucrative it is, lucrative it is. And actually it's embarrassing that I was making that kind of money doing the wrong thing. But ultimately, yeah, I would start over on September 1st, uh, 2012 with zero revenue. But, you know, but, you know, listen, I think that uh, when we continue with our, with our truth and we're able to explain it clearly, then the people will come to us when we're doing the right thing, then the revenue tends to follow that. And I know it's easy for me to say because I am a cardiologist and people would see me as, as, you know, the ultimate cardiac authority, therefore come to seek out my help. But again, I think that there are so many people who practice natural uh, uh, medicine and, and promote natural health care who are doing very, very well, opening up the eyes of people who are accountants and lawyers and people who drive you know, a truck. Like the number one uh, demographic, if you will, that comes to see me is, is, is a truck driver. It's like it, my, 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 my ideal patient is a 62 year old guy who drives a truck or maybe the woman who you know helps him or is married to him. I, I mean, again, so uh, I, I do think again that uh, we need to follow our path. And when we follow our path and we do it well and we fully commit to it, then we will have all the fruits of that labor. Wow, what a fantastic answer. I absolutely love that. You eventually decided to create your three pillars and how you explain kind of lifestyle changes to people. Can we go over each one of those three pillars and how you came up with each one? And then we can spend a little bit of time talking about each one and what are some of the, the primary principles? Well, you know, it's uh, it, it's all based on the methodology or my thought processes, which is not like unique to me necessarily. Again, a lot of people talk about this, but, you know, eat well, live well, think well. And then we test, don't guess. So we do the most advanced testing in the world to really determine where people are at. And there's a lot of different tests to really make sure you're on the right path to the path to the 100 year heart, as we say. And then there's evidence-based supplements. And then there's also these kind of, well, a lot of people would know as biohacking strategies, like should I get a sauna or should I get a red light lamp or should I get a vitamin D lamp or should I do, you know, cold plunge or should I do IV therapy or all these different devices. So again, I, I think all that is good. So we, again, you know, from there, we can certainly, you know, break it down. And I want to say this, that the eat well conversation is always debated and it's always discussed and discussed first, but it's no more important than what we would say is living well or thinking well. So we start off with eat well because that's kind of we're meeting where people are having that conversation. And for me, eating well really surrounds several things. Number one, no matter what diet we follow, always make it organic. Get the chemicals out of our food. If you're a vegan, vegetarian, uh, Mediterranean, paleo, keto, carnivore, if you're on the chocolate chip cookie diet, just make sure it's organic. Get the chemicals out of your food. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not telling people to eat a lot of sugar and a lot of carbs. I'm telling them to do that. or whatever it's about paleo nutrition but the paleo lifestyle but paleo nutrition is our hunter gatherer lifestyle how have our ancestors been eating since the dawn of human existence <clears throat> and we've been eating free range grass fed meats we've been eating wild seafood we've been eating eggs and avocados and coconuts and olives we've been eating nuts and seeds we've been eating vegetables and we've been eating fruit the fruit the you know we we as time went on, we had some amount of raw dairy. And as time would go on, we would start to introduce grains into our diet, wheat, barley, rye, corn, uh, soy. But again, these were much later into the whole process. So again, the way I like to focus it, Casey, is that again, always organic. I really promote and thinking about this is not so much of what should I not eat. If we really push the foods that we should be eating, there's not much room left over for the junk. So if we say, okay, I'm gonna try and eat uh, seafood every day, or I'm gonna try and eat nose to tail 
uh, animal. So I'm going to eat uh, meat and preferably organs at least, you know, uh, several times a week. And I'm going to eat the eggs and avocados and the coconuts and the olives. And I'm going to have vegetables and I'm going to have seasonal fruit in, in moderation. I'm going to eat some nuts and seeds. There's really not much room for any other junk. And then I'll wrap it up there, Casey, and say, you know, that I'm always gluten-free. And I think if people follow those tenets, again, of organic, eat a lot of wild seafood, eat nose to tail, grass-fed, grass-finished, uh, pasture-raised animals, and then again, go gluten-free, I think that's a fantastic uh, start. And then ultimately, right, there is a lot of high-carb, you know, low-carb type story. I'm not opposed to eating more carbs in the summertime, again, more fruit and, and more of the vegetables that are growing in the summertime. And the wintertime tends to be, uh, you, know, you know, more meat, more seafood may be predicated and a time for uh, potatoes, you know, for example, and, and other, uh, you know, and grains like quinoa, for example, or even a little bit of uh, wild rice. So I do believe in some cyclical variation. Again, uh, you know, the carbs, the sugar consumption, that's why we make insulin. We make insulin to perform functions like that. So if we do get in a lot of starchy carbs, we're able to take that and use that food for fuel. Uh, and I think that's okay. That sounds amazing. I'm sitting there listening to all the foods you list. I love the way that you put it. Like if you eat these things, there's not going to be much other space. You're listing things that are totally like satiating. Like you eat those things and you're just like satisfied. And it's not that you couldn't snack if you wanted to, but you don't really care. You go about your day and go do fun stuff, go ski, go on a walk, go paddleboard, go use your time. And I'm contrasting that with a, a few months ago, I, I decided to go to the American uh, Heart Association website and see their dietary guidelines. And I downloaded my fitness pal or whatever, started punching in to hit the macros that they recommend and to see all the meals and snacks that you would need to hit. It's just like, it was like 60 to 70% carbohydrates. And all of the foods I was putting into this tracker were like, if I tried to eat this, I would be starving. I would be starving. There's no way I would be satiated. Of course, I would want to snack on cookies and soda and whatever. I'm going to need pick-me-ups throughout that entire day, contrasted with what you mentioned, all these satiating foods. You're just not going to think about food. It's so different. Yeah, you know, again, the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, uh, the American Di uh, you know, Dietetic Association, Diabetes Association, they're all owned by industry. They're all owned by corporations. Uh, and, and that's what they're going to promote. They're going to promote the grain. They're going to promote the processed dairy. And that is, that, that is well known for, for decades that that is what's going on. And, you know, quite simply, right, you can uh, go to the American Heart Association website. You can see the, the sponsors right there. You can open up the journal of the American College of Cardiology and page after page after page is advertisement for the pharmaceuticals. So it clearly is a, a major problem. I mean, again, listen, you know, life is to be enjoyed. There's certain, you know, sweets and things like that that we're going to enjoy. Just make sure you do it organic. Make sure you get the chemicals out. If you want to eat, you know, ice cream, then get organic ice cream or do a homemade organic ice cream with raw, you know, with raw cream, raw milk, raw eggs, uh, vanilla and, uh, you know, raw honey and put it in your ice cream maker. Like it doesn't have to be some kind of processed kind of garbage. Again, I'm not sitting here promoting uh, the eating of those, but when you do eat them, make them the best of the best quality. But, you know, to our point, I don't want to argue too much about, you know, the food story, but again, let's dive into the, you know, to the living well, understanding that our ancestors, they went to sleep with the sun down. Well, you know, depending on, you know, where you at, you know, live at on this planet. I mean, but so many people right now, they live in the Northern Hemisphere. They live up at higher latitudes. So this time of year, the sun is going down, you know, at 5, 5, 30, 6 p.m. So we should not be awake too much after that. The average time people go to sleep in the United States is after midnight. And that's just a death sentence on so many different levels. Again, the artificial lights, uh, you know, that we're exposed to. That all has its own set of problems. That's well documented. When we are awake at night, we're typically eating unhealthy foods. We're not watching a movie at 10 o'clock thinking, let's have a broccoli salad. We're typically reaching for something unhealthy, you know, potato chips or pretzels or, or ice cream, as we mentioned. So again, uh, we want to get to sleep on time. We also want to get outside very often, understanding that our skin is a solar panel. It's built to collect light. So there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothes. Ideally, you get outside as often as you can with as much of your solar panel exposed. And in doing so, you're being physically active, you're moving. And of course, you don't have to go to a, 
uh, a lifetime fitness. You can do all this stuff in the comfort of your own home. And really, you could do it outside. And that's the best and the safest place to do that. And then also, and also in kind of like that living well, we talk about uh, oral health. You know, it's a good dental uh, care from a holistic dentist. We talk about chiropractic care from a qualified chiropractor to make sure your spine is in alignment and your autonomic nervous system is, is moving and balanced. And then I want to mention this final thing as regards to living well is that your environmental toxins. And we all know about things like med, uh, excuse me, uh, lead and mercury and aluminum and all those other toxic metals. And we also mention uh, uh, EMF. We're very aware of the dangers and damages of cell phones and Wi-Fi and, uh, and smart meters and all those things. And then again, we've got pesticides and plastics. I mean, the list of chemicals goes on very long, but I do want to make sure everybody is aware that the single most dangerous environmental toxin to anyone is when they live in a water damaged home or office or building. And that water damage has led to mold and mold mycotoxicity, meaning the mold releases these toxins in order to ensure its survival and how it impacts us. So let me say a couple more things about the mold. Again, mold from water damage. And again, you may not see the water damage. It may be seen, you know, you can see it in your shower, your sink, or your toilet, but it may be under the sink of the shower or the toilet. It may be in a crawl space or in a wall. And the mold wants to survive. It releases toxins to kill off other molds and bacteria and insects and uh, and viruses and you know and certainly humans. Now, the most common example of this is the mold penicillium produces a toxin that kills bacteria, and you may know that as penicillin. There is also a very well-known pharmaceutical called Celsept, and Celsept is an immunosuppressive. It suppresses your immune system, and it is so effective at suppressing your immune system that the pharmaceutical companies put it into a capsule. Again, the pharmaceutical is called Cellcept, and they give it to people who have organ transplants in order to prevent what's called a rejection, where the new host of that organ rejects the organ. So they take this product called Cellcept. And all cell sept is, is mycophenolic acid that comes from mold. And it's so powerful, so damaging to the immune system, the pharmaceutical companies use it as a drug. So those are just a couple examples of how ravaging the mold mycotoxins are. So whatever your health conditions or concerns are, please consider how mold can impact those those illnesses. Wow, that is crazy. I remember we did one episode where we deep dive into EMS in particular. And it's such an interesting kind of lifestyle thing to get into because you almost feel a resistance to it because there, it feels like there's so little that you can actually like do in a world where we live with cell phones everywhere and Wi-Fi is everywhere. Like what, what practically can be done? And I almost think the same way about mold. I, I feel like I've been, you know, resisting talking about it because I feel like, yeah, it might be important, but what do you, what do, you do if, if there's mold? It's the only thing to do is move? No, I mean, again, there, and let me say this too, is that, you know, regarding uh, EMS, regarding aluminum, regarding uh, uh, mercury or even pesticides, none of those things are, are living entities. So lead and mercury and EMF are not conscious and thinking, I want to injure, somebody in the vicinity. I want to, uh, you know, I'm led and I want to kill the person who just swallowed me. They don't think that, but mold does. Now, of course, mold does not have the consciousness that humans do, but mold is a survivor. Mold has been here since before humans were here. It knows how to survive. It's very, very, very successful at that. So yes, you know, there's things we can do about EMF. We can't totally avoid it. And there's things we can do about mold and we can't totally avoid it, but we can always work to limit those factors. So we can choose to turn off our Wi-Fi at night. We can choose to not watch technology at night. We can choose to, uh, you, know, you, you know, put the phone on airplane mode or get rid of the smart meter. We can choose 
to move out of a big city where there are, are towers all over the place, we can make those choices. I'm not saying it's easy, Casey. You and I both know that it's not. And again, there's a lot of other EMF mitigation strategies that people could do. I mean, there's there's you know silver canopies you could put around your bed, and you could put a paint you know on your wall that blocks EMF. I mean, there's a lot of things that you could do. But again, as it re relates to mold, some people's homes are so damaged, and they are so symptomatic from it that the easiest, certainly short-term solution, is to get out. It is to get out of the home while leaving all of your belongings, including your clothing inside. So sometimes we've told people, here's what you're gonna do, you're so sick. Here's what you're gonna not only do, but you're gonna need some support to do it because you're so brain fogged, you need help. So what we'd like you to do is there is a, um, a hotel that was built you know, four months ago, it, was, it just opened up this hotel. And uh, yes, it's got different environmental toxins in there, you know, and, you know, VOCs and all these outgassing things, but at least it should not have much in the way of mold. And you're going to walk into that room, you're going to shower, and there is going to be a new pair of clothing, uh, brand new clothing that you're going to now wear while you start the recovery process. So that's one possibility. Now, the other would be, of course, is that maybe you're not quite sick enough, and maybe, again, now you can stay in your home while you're making these decisions and look to find where the mold is coming from and then to have a quality company remediate it. Again, it's not easy, it's time consuming, it's expensive, it is by all definition the uh, the rabbit hole you know, of, of going down. And uh, uh, another, you know, I guess, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, like, uh, you know, Pandora's box, you know, to to use another uh, metaphor. Again, it's it's something that uh, is, is catastrophic. I think all people like you and I can do is open up people's eyes to the reality that no matter what your sickness is, it may be from mold, and you're best off to find out. Again, if you're impacted and there's home tests you can do, there's urine tests you can do on yourself, there's supplements you can take to bind down to these toxins. There's a lot of different possibilities that are there. But uh, uh, so Casey, I appreciate you letting me uh, have the opportunity to talk about this. I know it's again, it's uh, it, it's real easy to tell someone to take a pharmaceutical. It's real easy to tell someone to eat more seafood. It's real easy to tell someone to get better sleep or sunshine. Uh, but some of these other strategies, they can be more difficult, but uh, they're important. Yeah, it doesn't take away the truth. And people can decide what they want to do with that information. Maybe moving isn't the best thing to do right now, but they can keep it in the back of their minds and the situation changes in six months or a year or something. But at least that way, they have the knowledge and the information to do with it what they will rather than just suffering needlessly. One last question on the mold. Just based on your experience, I don't know if there's any way you could ever like prove this one way or another. But just based on your experience, the people that you've seen and everything you've learned about mold in particular, what percentage of people in America would you say this is a factor that is more significant than people think? Are, are we talking like 1% of the population? Is it like 50% of the population? Like how pervasive is mold as a problem for people? Again, I don't have any definitive literature. I can only tell you from my experience. And if I had to put a number on it, I would probably say 80 to 90% of people are impacted by mold. It could be it could be cardiovascular disease. It could be brain disease, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, other movement disorders, tremors that people have. It could be uh, uh, fertility issues. It could be low libido. It could be erectile dysfunction. It could be gut disorders. It could be skin disorders, rashes could be brain fog, could be lethargy, could be weight gain, could be weight loss. So that's why I say whatever your health condition is, and I mean, would you say that 80 to 90% of Americans have some kind of health condition? Oh, of course, For yeah. Sure. <laughs> right, right, I mean, I mean, everybody's got their something. And it, so if we're asking, okay, well, if, that, if pretty much everybody has got some form of sickness, again, whether they would say, well, it's not really a sickness, you know, occasionally I get eczema or I've got a little bit of arthritis. 
or, you know, yeah, I feel fatigued, but everybody does, or my blood pressure is a little bit high. Again, I mean, you know, we can make the case that mold is one of the contributing factors. And when we do everything else amongst eat well, live well, think well, our, our symptoms are likely to improve, but they typically will not be 100% improved. And the symptoms, the improvement is usually not a long lasting uh, thing. And it's uh, it's really enlightening for me because I think that you know mold really ties it all in together. It really ties it all in together in the sense of why people are sick. And again, you've, you know, you've had a lot of clients where it's like, I'm eating all the right foods. I'm doing all the things you're telling me, but I'm just, I'm not getting better or their lab results are abnormal. And I'm just going to tell you it's, it's mold until proven otherwise. Wow. Wow. Well, I really appreciate that. I realized that was just speculation on your part to kind of, um, you know, give some numbers to that. That's that's a much higher number than I would have expected. But I, I again, I really appreciate you and all the all the learning you've done in that tech category. Uh, let's go now to think well. Tell us a little bit about why think well is so important to be one of the three pillars that you talk about. Yeah, again, you know, in medical school, in our training, again, we get zero, uh, except for like a you know, short stint on a psychiatry rotation where there it's all just about pharmaceuticals. But I want people to understand this was chapter five of my book. And chapter five was called One Nation Under Prozac, where the answer, of course, is not Prozac in the sense of anger, anxiety, stress, depression, all markedly increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, strokes, atrial fibrillation, uh, heart failure, and dying. So we want people to understand that they better get a handle and a hold on their, uh, on their emotional wellness and, and, their, and their thought processes. And that could be through a lot of different ways and different categories of think well that are important. Spirituality, believing in uh, 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 God or whatever, whatever, you know, kind of, you know, either, either formalized religion or spirit that someone believes in. So having that spirituality, having a good community or connected connectedness where I feel I've got a lot of people around me who are like me, who I can confide in, who, who love me. So being connected, uh, that sense of, uh, you know, another thing is, you know, self-acceptance, understanding that, hey, um, I'm, I'm doing my best in this crazy world. I'm a good person. I'm a valuable person. Uh, so really, again, uh, having that, that sense of well-being about yourself. And then there's also, again, uh, you know, sense of, of, of security where people, you know, people feel safe. So find your, your safety zone. Find where, again, you you are surrounded by, uh, you know, again, whether it's good people or you feel secure in your environment. And, and, and again, that's very important for mental health uh, and wellness. And then finally, that sense of purpose where um, this is what I'm here to do. I am here in this form on this planet to, to do something. And I think it kind of takes us back, Casey, to the original thing about how, well, conventional medicine can be very lucrative, but if it's not your purpose, you'll never be fulfilled. If you're not happy doing that, again, you could be making all the money in the world. Uh, and if it's not your purpose, you'll never be happy and therefore you'll never be healthy. So we want people to understand all those processes. And then again, you know, different things, whether it's, you know, yoga, meditation, Tai Chi, uh, relaxing activities, breathing activities, all those things can help you inside of that, that thinking well process and dealing with all the stress and anxiety and, and, and fear that especially the last three years have brought to us. You know, take for example, we you know, we mentioned community and connectedness. Well, social isolation, which has been prevalent uh, and 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 uh, you know forced upon us over the last three years, the amount of death and destruction that caused again. We we know from the literature and many studies, social isolation. People who uh, are not around other people, do not have good contacts, do not have good community, they die much younger than those of us who do have that sense of community. So continue to foster that. And frankly, social media can be a good uh, good way 
to for a lot of people to foster that kind of community. You may not have people in your immediate uh, area. You may not have friends and family, but sometimes again, getting that connectedness to, to people online can be beneficial. That is such an interesting and cool point. I think a lot of us in this world poo-poo social media all the time. And it's like, well, you know, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of things wrong with social media, but there is also some benefit. And I love how practical you are with all kinds of different techniques and things that people can be doing. You know, you mentioned the yoga and the breathing and the meditation and, you know, even things like journaling can really help people if if, if they're listening to you and thinking like, yeah, I would love to have a sense of purpose. I would love to have a safety net of people around me who cared about me, but maybe they don't. I, I'm glad you listed so many different things so people can kind of pick and choose and see what works out best for them. Is that what you found in your experience as well? Yeah, certainly. And again, like even back to the social media, like we all know the problems with social media. Uh, but that being said, again, we've got like a Facebook group for natural heart doctor and we've got 10,000 people on there. And we build that as, a sense of community, like, hey, everybody's in here seeking natural heart health. So again, you can make friends in here. We've done uh, courses and we've done group coaching programs. And we have a lot of people who stay connected with these people for a very long time or even still connected uh, afterwards. Uh, you know, in, in our office in Arizona, we invite people to kind of come in, hey, grab a cup of organic mold mycotoxin uh, 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 free coffee, or again, come in and use the Wi-Fi and, and have a snack, have a, have a paleo snack or, 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 or none of it, just kind of come in and be around other like-minded people, introduce yourself because the people across the room, they're very likely to be very similar to you and, uh, and establishing that kind of friendship, I think is important. I think so too. I love that. And and it, it's cool what happens in a group setting if the group meets long enough, whether it is in person or whether it is online, it stops being something like Dr. Wilson, Wilson said this, and I've got to do this because he said that. It's more like, oh, we're all kind of in this together. What worked for you? Well, I went through this. Let me give you this advice. And everybody just starts like naturally helping each other and being the ones giving the good advice to people. It's not like a top down thing. It's like everybody's in this together. And I love that. I, I think it helps you know, really validate people and what they're learning about low carbohydrate living or, you know, whatever it is, eating a natural diet, a paleo diet or whatever. I think that can be very, very helpful. That's great. Um, I also want to talk to you, not just about the pillars, but also something that you mentioned, um, testing, not guessing. Why is that so important? And what are some of your very favorite tests that you like to do on your patients? Yeah. So, you know, again, we can all talk about, hey, I'm eating well, I'm living well, I'm thinking well, uh, therefore I'm doing good. Well, again, that's where test don't guess comes in, because how do you know you're not deficient in uh, vitamins? So, for example, whether it's, uh, you know, B1, B6 uh, or, or vitamin A or any of the vitamins or a mineral, how do you know you're not deficient in copper or zinc or selenium, so on and so forth? What's your omega-3 levels? What are your CoQ10 levels? What are your uh, you know, uh, essential, you know, fatty acid levels, looking at markers of inflammation. There's so many different areas we can go with this, Casey. Again, what are your levels of mold mycotoxins? What are your environmental toxins, pesticides, phthalates? What about leaky gut? Uh, what about, again, uh, gluten sensitivity, food sensitivities? And the beauty of it is there's a lot of companies that are doing it the right way. We're getting a lot, a lot of information on people and then using that to, to guide uh, other things inside of eat well, live well, think well, and then of course using that to guide evidence-based supplements. So with a cardiologist, I think most people would ask you about a standard lipid profile. If somebody is just getting a standard lipid profile, this is very inexpensive. They're looking at a few metrics at a doctor's office. Do you find any value in a standard lipid profile or should people really be going more in depth and getting more, uh, you know, I guess more exotic tests? Yeah, the, the, uh... The standard testing for you know, like the standard lipid uh, panel, again, total cholesterol is not a very useful value whatsoever. We've known that since the 1970s. Uh, even total LDL and HDL do not provide a lot of value. We can calculate ratios with some of that information that can be useful. We can also look at triglycerides and say, well, for every bit of elevation, triglycerides are up. So does cardiovascular risk. But again, much more important than standard lipids would be the markers of inflammation. Uh, your lipids may appear normal on that standard test, but you have a lot of inflammation, such as HSCRP uh, or phospholipase A2 or uh, oxidative stress like oxidized LDL or myeloperoxidase uh, and lipid peroxides. And again, if all that's going on, we need to continue to figure out why. 
And what's different about myself, of course, and, and holistic practitioners is that instead of reaching for uh, statin drugs or aspirin or other pharmaceuticals, we want to know why. Why does someone have these lipid abnormalities? Why does someone have inflammation? Why does someone have elevated homocysteine? Why does someone have LP little a? What can we do about that? So again, uh, you know, I guess in short, Casey, I'm testing hundreds of different parameters on people to really give them an insight as to where they're at. And then, of course, make changes and then test what we need, what needs to be tested down the road and see how we did and make sure we're on track for, again, for the 100 year heart. Yeah, that sounds great. Any other tests that you run that aren't uh, blood based? Do you do any other physical testing on people? Uh, any value in that? Well, I mean, there's definitely a lot of different tests that are out there. I'm totally against the CT scan. So a lot of people get coronary CT scans, EBCT uh, scans. I'm totally against radiation based uh, testing. Uh, and the, you know, I mean, other tests, again, we do like a salivary nitric oxide test strip, and I think EKG has value and ultrasounds have value, but we do urine testing, we do stool testing, we do salivary testing, uh, a lot of different things that, that can be done. We do a lot of hormonal uh, analysis and, and optimizing hormones, and there's a lot of different strategies for that. But again, we don't run to give somebody testosterone or maybe some new peptide therapy or anything like that. Uh, until we get them on the eat well, live well, think well. And we we test, don't guess, and we optimize the foundation first. And then th there's a time for some of these other strategies, whether it's hormones or peptides or ozone or hyperbaric or, uh, you know, again, sauna and, uh, and, you know, cold thermogenesis and some of these other, you know, biohacking techniques. Yeah, very cool. So ab about supplementation, I know without the testing, we don't really know where people are specifically deficient. Could you, again, just speculation in your own experience, could you just say, what, what are your top favorite supplements for most people, regardless of whether they are getting advanced testing or not, what do you think most people could benefit from supplementing in their diet? Well, I think, you know, yeah, you know, we have a supplement that's a, uh, a grass-fed, grass-finished American bison product. It's a liver heart complex. So I think a lot of people don't want to eat the organs, but we can sneak the organs in uh, based on, you know, again, uh, you know, taking a capsule. If people don't want to eat the food, they have that option. And I think that's really foundational. Uh, liver and, uh, and heart are the two most nutrient-dense things you could find. I mean, there's nothing more nutrient-dense uh, than liver. There's no kale or shard, you know, or oatmeal that even is in the same stratosphere as what's inside of a healthy animal's liver. So again, we like that. We like probiotics. Uh, you know, we like, uh, you know, some of the shake mixes, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, contain, you know, for example, like, uh, you know, whey protein, I think is, I think is good. There are certain things that help to increase nitric oxide levels that therefore improve circulation and blood pressure. And that can be things like beetroot powder or amino acids, L-arginine, L-citrulline, L-taurine. Uh, from, from a lipid standpoint, there's things like berberine and of course, uh, you know, curcumin and ginger that, uh, that can be a nice uh, natural way to, to optimize, you know, a lipid panel and there's natural blood thinners. And I mean, again, fortunately in our toolbox, there are, are, are literally hundreds, if not thousands of different supplement choices that that could be beneficial. And again, if we can use test, don't guess to dial that in, that's always going to be a benefit. Yeah, that sounds great. You already mentioned earlier getting exposure to the sun, and that's one of our best primary ways to get vitamin D synthesis in our bodies, which is so important. I think most of us who lived through COVID understood that vitamin D was brought up a lot as something that was very important. Where are you with vitamin D supplementation? Do you feel like that's as effective if people don't have the option to get outside or if it's like us being in the Northern Hemisphere, being in a Northern state where you know you can't really even generate that much vitamin D in the sun at these latitudes? Do you believe in supplementing vitamin D in those situations? I'm not a huge vitamin D supplementer. And certainly, you know, most people should know by now that if you supplement D, you got to supplement vitamin K, okay. uh, you know, specifically K2. K2 keeps calcium in the bones and out of the arteries. We test people's K2 levels. Very, very, very useful test. Uh, regarding vitamin D supplementation, again, I like to get it from nature. So number one, yes, we get it from uh, the sun and it's easy to do in the summertime. In the winter time, of course, it's not easy. And most people are at latitudes where they get no vitamin D production whatsoever. So for those people, we tell them to take a lot of vacations. Okay, well, uh, I'm not gonna move. I'm not gonna take a lot of vacations. What else do you got for me? Well, again, when you eat animal products, seafood, the nose to tail, uh, uh, you know, beef or bison, uh, chicken, when you eat 
Uh, eggs, when you eat even raw dairy products, you get a lot of vitamin D from that. So you get it from the food sources. You can't get vitamin D from, from plants. You got to get it from the food, uh, uh, from, the, from the animal products. And then also you can get a vitamin D lamp. So that's another good strategy for people. Uh, and there's a company, you know, who sells that uh, as well. And, and that's available, vitamin D lamp. And, you know, we live in the mountains of Colorado. I do all the things I said, and I typically use a vitamin D lamp. Vitamin D as a supplement inside of, of a multivitamin, I think is okay. Uh, maybe in the situation where you are feeling acutely ill, maybe you feel like you're getting some kind of a virus or something again, that's, that's impacting your immune system. Uh, vitamin D can be one of those supplements to, to assist in, in quickly uh, ramping uh, it up. I mean, we know again from uh, African children with measles, uh, that vitamin D supplementation in that population who was deficient, uh, you know, again, it, it was markedly beneficial uh, for those people and, and vitamin A, for example. So it was, uh, I mean, lower, you know, vitamin A lowered mortality by like uh, 85%. Wow, that's crazy. You know, during this whole conversation, I keep thinking back to something Nina Teicholz says in her book, The Big Fat Surprise, where it's like we shifted our diets and lifestyles, you know, half a century ago for one problem, and that was heart disease. We changed our entire dietary recommendations, our lifestyle shifted, we changed everything to address that one thing, and it didn't work. And everything that you're describing today can address heart health that will work and it does so many other wonderful things. You're going to be lean. You're going to lose weight. You're going to maintain muscle mass. You're going to be strong. You're going to have healthy bones and a healthy gut and healthy skin. Do you ever just reflect on how amazing it is that once we have the right inputs into the body, how easily it can heal and self-correct and be good for so many different things, not just heart health? Yeah, you know, again, medical doctors are really good at labels, right? This person has... Uh, has liver disease, this person has brain disease, this person has cancer, this person has cardiovascular disease, this person has autoimmune disease uh, or asthma or allergies, you know, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, but the reality is they're all from the same causes. They're from violations of eat well, live well, think well. And if we eat well, live well, think well, that is our best strategy to avoid sickness, to heal from sickness uh, as well. Uh, health will never be found in a prescription bottle. It's never going to be found at, at a tip of a needle. It's going to be found by giving your body what it needs, taking away what it doesn't. And that's our, that's our success plan. I mean, again, we, we, uh, let me say this too, is that, you know, I, I, uh, I hear the genetics, you know, conversation a lot. And the medical doctors even like to say, well, it's, it's you know, it's your genetics. It's in your family history. Well, I think our genetics are perfect until we screw it up. The man-made foods, the man-made toxins, that's what, you know, you know, screws it up. Man-made thought processes and traumas that happen to us. That's what damages the body. And uh, it don't blame it on your genetics. Don't blame it on, again, well, you know, my mother had this. Again, you have this like your mother because you eat and live like your mother did. But if you went back many, many, many generations, they did not have these health ailments. Yeah, such a great point. Man, this has been an awesome conversation. Is there anything that you are planning on or preparing for in the future, something that gets you really excited? Well, you know, again, I, uh, you and I were talking about this before. I've got my uh, event coming up in February. February is Heart Month. Uh, for Certainly for me, every, every month is Heart Month, but February is Nationally Recognized Heart Month. And we've got an online event coming up called Your Path to the 100 Year Heart. I interview about 35 different experts uh, in that field. And again, if people are connected to us and they're connected to us on social media or they're on our email list, uh, or again, even, you know, people like yourself are certainly uh, uh, welcome to help us promote getting the truth out there. The truth is going to win the day. And, uh, you know, the more people we get involved, the more people learn, the more, uh, the, more the, the good guys win. That sounds absolutely fantastic. Dr. Jack Wolfson, where can people go so that they can find you, connect with you and your work, and also um, get those resources that you talked about? Well, thank you so much. Again, Free Heart Book is a great place to start to get a copy of my Amazon best-selling book at Free Heart Book. And then again, our website is Natural Heart Doctor, all spelled out, Natural Heart Doctor. And... Um, you know, that's where, uh, that's where you can find us. You can Google me and you'll find some interesting things. And typically those of us holistic practitioners who've been around for a while, uh, we've got, uh, you know, certainly a lot of, a lot of uh, positive things said about us, a lot of negative things uh, said about us. But uh, as long as people are talking about us, that's the key.
Yeah, that's great. I get Twitter comments all the time where it's like, well, at least you're saying something. I appreciate it, even if it's not the nicest thing to say. Dr. Jack Wolfson, to be able to do what you did, be trained in the way that you were, to witness tragedy in your own family, but to be able to take that and now continue your father's legacy and to be able to help people in a different way than the system is teaching, I think is absolutely marvelous. And so thank you so very much for everything that you have gone through. Thank you for what you're doing now. And thank you so much for taking time to be on our show today. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much, Casey. Appreciate it. Absolutely. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio.